You're listening to Tone Benders, the Sound Designers Podcast. Let's do this. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Tone Benders. I am your host for today. My name is Tim Muirhead, and I am over the moon to welcome our guest today from the hit Disney Plus Marvel series, WandaVision. For those that have may not seen the show yet, it follows Avenger Wanda Maximoff's journey from powerful but untrained hero to becoming the Scarlet Witch, which we've all known from the comics for decades. Joining us today are co-supervising sound editors Gwendolyn Yates-Whittle and Kim Foscato, as well as re-recording mixer Daniel Dupree. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Nice to be here. Hi. Hi. Nice to be here. So WandaVision takes place kind of over many decades, although it doesn't. Anyone who's seen the show will understand that. How much research did you all do to kind of get the feel of the authentic sitcoms of the various decades that the show covers? Gwen? For myself, I just have to say it was actually really fun because you go back and you watch the Dick Van Dyke show and then you got to watch Bewitched and then you got to watch all these sitcoms that you hadn't seen. Some of you weren't even alive when they came out. (laughs) So the research was was probably some of the most enjoyable research I've ever done. Danielle? Yeah. I mean, so like one was saying, I, I was not alive when these TV shows aired, but a big part of my childhood was watching them on syndicated television. And I just, you know, was just kind of a loner, but I loved, I, <laughs> I loved watching, you know, so Saturday morning cartoons, I'd watch, you know, Dick Van Dyke, Mary Tyler Moore, Brady Bunch, um, Laverne and Shirley, Happy Days, all that. So it, it was, I, I did a, I did a lot, a lot, a lot of research um, going into this to kind of just you know, watch those things again from, from a sound perspective. And what did you take from the research? Back in the day, there was no foley. People in Bewitched, they floated, their feet never touched the ground. There was very little extra. It was very what they said and the music and the laugh track. And the laugh track was a huge part of it. And also, we had a laugh track expert on the show because even the quality of the laugh tracks changed. So what the laugh track quality or type of even laughing that you hear in Dick Van Dyke is very different than you hear in Bewitched or Modern Family or anything like that. I guess Modern, no, Modern, which one of them, the music took over. I can't remember which one that was. Modern Family wouldn't have a laugh track. That was also fascinating. There's a guy in L.A. who is the laugh track expert guy. Did you uh, follow that and not have any Foley, or did you put Foley in? We gave it a lot of thought. Uh, I remember the first time I sat down and I watched the whole series through, I was so excited. It was kind of like a like a mixer's dream because you see how everybody involved in production, everybody nailed it from the... Obviously, the performances are spot on, set design is spot on, costume design is spot on, and so it was just kind of like, ah, this is very exciting, uh, but we have to make this spot on. We have to be as, you know, as true to this as, as possible. And so kind of our first ideation of this, our first attempt of it was obviously kind of futzing the idea of um, futzing each episode to make it sound as specific to the era's television set, basically. So, it, you know, for Dick Van Dyke, it would sound like it was coming out of a late 50s, early 60s TV set and then gets older throughout the series. Um, so I did, um, I did a lot of kind of like spectral frequency analyzing. I got copies of the old television shows and, and split out, you know, dialogue, music, and effects audio um, from those clips and kind of ran, you know, a, like at least an hour or two of each um, kind of food group through a spectral frequency analyzer to kind of understand um, what was what was being recorded on set, what was, act- what was actually being captured by those um, microphones at the time. And then Kim, who had just finished on Mank with Ren Kleiss, she was like, you know, you should talk to Chuck Duran about all the things that he did for Mank for his patina pass. So I did that and we were kind of already on the same page. Um, but he also gave me a lot of really good ideas on like how to kind of take the original recordings of these old TV shows that I had and ambience match them and kind of get this really nice old timey fill noise to kind of fill in that kind of grainy, the kind of the similar, the audio equivalent of what a film grain would be. So that was our first approach in trying to recreate that. Matt Shackman, who is just, like, brilliant, the director who is just, I don't, it's hard to imagine it gets much better than than that as far as um, quality of human being and quality of storytelling and creative vision. We sent some of our original kind of futzes for the different episodes over for him to take a look at, and we kind of played around with them, a a bunch of different versions of them. But being the thoughtful storyteller that he is, we kind of got to a point where we realized that a big part of the plot meant that we had to be in the TV set with them. We had to be experiencing the sitcom with Wanda and Vision. 
Whereas the futzes that we were kind of putting on, uh, that we had kind of assumed that we would we would work with, were kind of pushing the viewer away a little bit. You know, you were watching it through a TV set, through another TV set, where a big part of the story point was that it was supposed to be surreal and you were supposed to be in this experience with them. So then we kind of shifted gears a little bit to kind of what Gwen was saying of let's actually analyze what type of sounds were being used back then, you know, and there wasn't really post-production. So really what we had to understand and, and what I had to understand was what sounds the microphones were picking up and what, you know, what actual production sound back then sounded like. Obviously, our first episode was pretty, pretty mono. We spread out into the left and right channels for kind of the more surreal moments um, to kind of hint that maybe there's another world out there. Uh, but the first episode was all about basically taking everything out and having it be really, really, like, excruciatingly bare. <laughs> like, I remember when the first episode aired, we were towards the end of the series in the big Marvel explosion part and I remember hearing it hearing the first episode on my television and I'm just like oh my god there's nothing there <laughs> there's nothing there <laughs> but it was the exact right thing to do it's exactly yeah. what what you needed so I mean I personally think it's brilliant I think you did a brilliant job Kim your thoughts yeah I agree and the fact that it evolved over time you know and and even the fans mentioned that in a couple of the posts that we saw where fans were like Noticing how the it went from the mono to the gradual stereo, and then it would get bigger, and that was kind of nice. Yeah, yeah. So the nice thing about having the episodes kind of mapped out throughout time like that was that we we could really be specific in how and when and where we were going to start filling in the soundtrack more, and start spreading it. You know, going from the classic monophonic into the stereo spread that we saw from television evolution over time. First episode kept everything just straight up the center, stacked on top of each other, um, and really tried to recreate what a soundstage back then sounded like as far as, you know, they were, they were big and they were relatively empty and concrete, and so there was a lot of natural room, you know, on the, especially Dick Van Dyke stuff. Um, so kind of recreating that a little bit. Um, you know, nobody really had labs back then. It was all shot, you know, on one or two ambient mics. Um, so that was another thing we, we worked towards is getting that old time soundstage room to it and, you know, getting the um, laugh track that we had spent so much time curating just right, you know, right up there, right against the dialogue to a point where it was kind of like, ah, you know, you want to make sure you hear them, but you also want to kind of sell the idea that they're in front of a live studio audience in pretty close quarters and they're just all kind of stacked on top of each other. Obviously, as the episodes went on, we panned things wider and added more elements. You know, when we got to the Brady Bunch episode, that was a lot of fun to be able to start adding more elements that we wouldn't necessarily add that, we, you know, we brought in some Foley finally um, for some really nice, like, lush kind of texture to all the carpeted sets and the big upholstered couches and stuff. It was really fun to build the soundtrack out through each episode and, and um, widen the soundtrack as we moved along. Let's talk a bit about episode one. There was actually a live studio audience, right? The whole thing was not shot in front of a live audience, but a major part of it. It was actually kind of nice because we got to pilfer from that lovely laugh track into other episodes at best to sweeten the stuff that we then recreated for the episodes. I think episode one was the only one that was in front of a live studio audience. I don't think the other ones were. So you obviously had an array of mics up to capture that actual audience. You weren't using canned laughter? I personally did not, but... <laughs> The location recorders did. I was not on the set, so but I, I know that they did. I, I don't know. I can't tell you off the top of my head which mics they used, or but I but I do know that they used the classic, just from listening to Matt talk and the, the various you know other executives. They definitely used a classic. I think probably a three camera television live studio audience setup kind of thing. And those recordings got to you. They're in the show. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Definitely. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, yeah. I think they're used up until like what the fourth or fifth episodes. We got them sprinkled in there. We had to change them a little bit as the episodes went on because the, the the quality of the laugh tracks had to change with the with the era. But they were sort of a, a good base to sit the other stuff up on. So the expert that you mentioned earlier for the laugh track, did he supply you with more realistic 70s laugh tracks or you still had to create it? We had to record it. We hired a, you know, it was a pandemic loop group where you had, you know, 
I don't know, 12 people in their closets over Source Connect going into one. Matt Wood was the ADR supervisor, and he kind of wrangled those incredibly complicated situations. So, but yeah, it's a, it's kind of funny. And the, to make these old timey laugh tracks, we had to use super modern technology to, to, just because of the pandemic, we weren't allowed to be in the same room together. It was kind of ironic in a way. So speaking of the pandemic, that obviously threw a wrench into, I assume, the entire post-production process. So this series was not originally meant to be released in the order that it was. I guess maybe this question's for Danielle. You're mixing, I assume, in either solitary or with much fewer people around than normal. And this series has got a lot riding on it, and you're kind of mixing alone in a room. What, what's going through your head while you're working on this? <laughs> Portrait of a woman unhinged, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely what it felt like. Uh, thank God I was in a room, room alone. Thank God I didn't have to subject people to my um, just complete near breakdowns. Um, it was uh, definitely a more isolating experience than it would be on like a classical dub where you have the editors sitting right next to you. However, our amazing staff at Skywalker figured out really, really quickly how to kind of simulate that as best as we could. So we have kind of a proprietary software um, that allows us to launch these Google Meet Hangouts with all of our editors who are at home. Basically, when I press play in my room and my room is filled with noise, hopefully nice sounding noise, it mutes my feed and it mutes the feed of the people at home and then they're listening back on a third-party uh, playback system like Clearview or something like that. And then when I stop the bus, everybody's microphones open up and, and we can kind of have our normal dialogue that we would have. Um, so our wonderful editors and, and, and our supervisors, Gwen and Kim, uh, basically hung out with me the entire time, just staring at me in, in my little solitary confinement. And you know what um, she had for lunch every day. Yeah, I would <laughs> stare at the camera and just shovel it in my mouth while I was talking to them very gracefully. It was especially interesting because the schedules on these things are just unbelievably short, and um, the mixers come on very much at the tail end. So, you know, I was coming into a groove that Gwen and our incredible sound designer, Steve Orlando, had already had with the clients talking about notes and and whatnot. So it was, it was kind of a challenge, you know, figuring out a what's what and and where to find it. And then B, um, you know, what, what had been discussed up to that point, you know, in, in the relationship that we had built with the clients. I mean, thank God I had Gwen and thank God I had Steve and, and Kim. They were telling me, where things were and, and helping me out. So, I, you know, I never, really, I never really felt alone, but it was definitely a, an added... This whole thing was, was crazy, being that it was, you know, the first streaming live-action thing that Marvel did. So you're totally right. There was a ton, a ton, a ton, ton of pressure behind that. And then on top of that, not being able to really, like, be in the room with people to kind of foster that creative environment was a bit hard. But ultimately, we figured it out. I think it went as good, if not better, than if if this were a normal setup, you know. It was really unusual to do Zoom playbacks of your temp mix and then the final mix, and everybody's on headphones. <laughs> it's just kind of like, it, it, it was very unusual and very strange, because normally you do it you do it in a theater, everyone's there, and everyone's hearing the same thing and reacting in the same way to the same content. But when everyone's in their house... <laughs> by themselves, either on headphones, and you have the, the, the consistency, the, the baseline, it doesn't exist, which has kind of un- made it very unusual. Luckily, everyone, we were all figuring it out together, which may have helped us too, because we, you know, we, I think towards the end, the later episodes, everyone's kind of, they knew what to expect and they, they kind of had it down which is good because those episodes were way more complicated. At least we got to figure it out on, oh, we don't need any Foley in this episode, but let's figure out everything else. And so as the episodes got more complicated, we kind of figured out our flow of how to best do our playbacks for them and get notes back from the, and the, the pacing of that schedule too. We figured that out. And then it, that took a little bit because, you know, it's, you can't have Danielle work on it for two days and turn it around and then expect to have reasonable notes. That doesn't make any sense. She's had it for two days kind of thing. So we had to change that expectation. You have to give her time to actually mix it, not just transfer it kind of thing. I think the other the other challenge with this mix process is that everybody's listening on their own system. 
whereas Danielle is in a mixed stage. Um, and I think that she had to be a lot more proactive about sw- going back and forth between the 2-1 and the 5-1 because not everybody was listening to the playback of the mixes on 5-1. Some of them were listening in stereo. We did have a mix stage live at um, Disney that we were feeding the mix to so they could hear it with the full mix. The director and the editor of that episode, they would go to the stage if they could. You know, it got a little challenging towards the end because I think there was a ramp up in pandemic activity. At the very beginning, for the first four or five episodes, uh, we could go in and sit with Danielle during the playbacks. Like, whoever was supervising or sound designing that episode could be in the room with her. But somewhere around, I guess it was like November, after Thanksgiving, it like the ranch went, nope, just one person in that room. And so then it became, everybody was remote. So then it, that, that was a little bit m- more of a challenge because we couldn't really hear what she was hearing. You know. Yeah. One of the many very challenging things about this project was that, again, it's it's not only their first big budget live action streaming, but streaming, mixing for streaming is entirely different than mixing for theatrical. You have two really big variables you that are entirely different. You're not, you know, you're mix, when you're mixing for theatrical, you're in what, A, a calibrated mix environment that a majority, you know, obviously people have complaints about major theater is not being calibrated correctly, but there is a guideline as to how loud this will play back, as to where your speakers in your room are going to be, as to how the room is going to be shaped, and the materials that are made, uh, that, that are used to make that room. Um, but this will never be heard, you know, unless we do, unless we do theatrical releases of these, these things will never be heard in, in an environment like that. And it is very much the reverse of how we're used to thinking about it. Um, in theatrical, we're used to thinking about it in terms of mix it wide, mix it big, and then think about the stereo at the very, very, very end. But it's completely the reverse. You know, the, the numbers are out for Disney Plus now, and I think, you know, well over 80, I think close to 90% of people are listening to the stereo. You know, it's not necessarily as sexy to think about it that way but if you want to if you want to do a good job you know you want to be listening and you want to be mixing to the format and to the environment that a majority of the world is going to hear it in so you know it was a bummer that everybody was kind of at home listening in a variety of different locations but I also think that worked to our advantage a lot because everybody was significantly closer to the actual like native playback um, experience that everybody's going to be hearing and so it took a few episodes, like Kim was saying, of switching back and forth between the Atmos, the 5 and the stereo, between my big speakers, between my near-field speakers, between my teeny, t- teeny, tiny TV speakers, to really get a feel for how things translated. Um, but it did, it did really change the way I approached mixing, the way I approached panning. If you want to make something move across the room in a 5-1 or an Atmos setup, it's going to be a very different pan than if you want to make that feel like it actually has movement in a two-speaker setup, you know. So a lot, of, a lot of trial and error, a lot of flipping back and forth and trying to understand, you know, how this is actually going to sound in, in the real world. Um, the headphones weren't the worst place to monitor. <laughs> I will say that. It's not, you know, it, w- it would have been if this were a theatrical mix, but, you know, I think it kind of worked in our favor a little bit for this. For sure. I have a quick question for Kim and Gwen. You're co-supervising sound editors on this. What does that mean? How do you pass the ball back and forth? Kim, do you want to take that first? Sure. I came on probably about a couple weeks before we started mixing. And part of the reason why I came on to co-supervise was because Gwen had another show that she was going on to to play with giant dinosaurs. And so um, we needed somebody to sort of hand off the show to. So I kind of was more integral towards the latter part of December, January, February sections, although I did do a lot of cutting and was in on decision making and stuff like that and meeting with the directors. I did a bunch of the ADR recordings at five in the morning with Lizzie in London, which was really fun. Um, You know, I think the co-supervising thing, it kind of, it, it, it's different for every show. You know, some shows have one co- one supervisor. Some shows will have two, maybe a dialogue supervisor and effect supervisor, which I think actually is the best way to work because for me, I'm a dialogue person. So I know who my best dialogue editors are and the people that I want to work with, the people that I can count on. And 
when I do a show with a sound designer, I want them to pick their team because they know who they can work with. And, you know, and sometimes that'll be based on availability. And so in that scenario, I think that the co-supervisors, having two of them works well uh, with a dialogue and an effects supervisor. And in this case, it was more of a handoff. I was going to pick up when Gwen had to go off and play with dinosaurs. And how did that work for you, Gwen? I was supposed to start on the other Marvel show that was supposed to come first, and then that kind of kept messing around. And then this one just had its act together sooner. So they said, oh, let's do WandaVision first. I was like, okay. So I started on WandaVision. And, um, it, you know, based on Pandemic 7, they hadn't finished shooting, but there was this other looming thing that I knew I had to leave for. And I said, well, it's going to be better if I you know, have somebody that I trust and I know can do a, uh, just kind of walk in and take care of stuff for me. And so I just kind of brought her in and we just kind of gradually passed it off. Uh, Steve Orlando was a sound designer through the whole thing. He was, he was, a, he and Daniel were the consistent ones on the entire show, which I think was really good because Steve is very Marvel savvy and he knows where the Mind Stone sound came from and what yeah, exactly. what magic came from this and so he he knows all the legacy of all almost I think probably every single sign you want to know the history of it Steve says oh well we made that for blah 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 blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. really needed because there's a lot of if you're a Marvel Mar- Marvel person there's a lot of little uh, Easter eggs through, throughout the episode set and he will he will know how to make those sonically work as well. Um, but yeah, working with Kim, it just kind of, at a certain point, I had to say, I mean, everybody knew it. It made me very sad because I, I really wanted to finish it off because I love WandaVision and I love Matt and I love working with Danielle and everything. And it was actually really, it was hard to leave. But it obviously, when they went, it went fine. They didn't need me. It's great. <laughs> it's a pretty sneaky move because you did the first four episodes where there's not much going on sound wise. And then we're like, okay, everything's about to explode. Hand it off to you. I had my hand in all of them, believe it or not, because we, okay, we all worked okay. on all of them. And, but as far as the mixing goes, I kind of went up through episode episode seven as well. Oh, okay. So you did a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I did the I did some voice processing for White Vision and Red Vision early on. I mean, we're all we're kind of we all basically like episode two. Those reshoots happened really, really, really late. So believe it or not, we did like episode three, four, five, and then went back into two. So it's it's, oh. it's not quite as linear as you would think because they had to shoot the um, the whole magic show stuff was was shot very late because they had to wait till people could regroup. So you mentioned earlier about having to bring in legacy sounds from other Marvel projects, like the Mind Stone sound and such. Is it in your mind when you're designing sounds that you know are going to live on past WandaVision? Uh, for instance, like Monica Rabot's sounds? That's probably a Steve question, but he would say yes. <laughs> I mean, he would say absolutely that stuff is, I mean, yeah. obviously the directors and the picture editors have their own ideas of how stuff should sound out. The director's got the final say, but they want your input on it and they want it. You can say, well, you know, the Mind Stone in this sounded this way or the Tesseract. It's a little different in Captain Marvel than it is in whichever movie it started off in and so they do more of a Wanda's magic her, her that comes out of her hands. I mean, it's started in one of those earlier movies, and it's kind of changed a little in this one, but it's based on the original red mm-hmm. magic that she had. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, but the legacy of it, that's how all these Marvel things work. I mean, that's why that's why people love them, because you can, it's like this yeah, gigantic family. Yeah, it's all interconnected. Like, I think there's sounds in, Mar- in WandaVision li- in the latter episodes... That will be in uh, other Marvel movies coming up. And, you know, that's just the way that Marvel... I mean, I've worked on five Marvel films, and they all... It's like you can tie a line between them. And and that also goes for the television series as well. Like, you know, Agents of Marvel will pick up where Thor left off, and you're like, holy crap. So if you're not part... If you're not really watching where this all goes, you're missing something. So there is... they They plan out ahead how all these characters are going to interact and how they're going, like, I'm sure that, you know, the next couple of series are all going to be, you know, you'll see them in the movies coming up too. You know, that's kind of how Marvel works. There's a, there's a long tie line of, of story there. But yeah, talk about, talk about pressure. Like poor Steve Orlando, who 
couldn't ha- like he knocked it out of the park in every aspect of what he did from Wanda's early magic sounding like the magic from Bewitched to Monica Rambeau's new magic to the Book of the Damned, which is like no pressure going to be the whole whole premise of the next movie and his design is going to be used as a basis for that. There's, I think, easily at least three huge storylines and three huge movies that will be using his design as a basis and it's just, you know, on top of that, going from 1950s to full Marvel Universe to, oh, back to the 80s and now we got to talk about Doctor Strange and... <laughs> I don't really know if there's anybody who could have done that as well as Steve Orlando. He did such an incredible job under so much pressure. And um, you just lo- you go onto Reddit and people are losing their minds over the stuff that he... And obviously people in the sound community love it as well, but he knows how to talk to the fans through our soundtrack. He really does. And it was, so, it was such a rewarding experience for him to be like, oh, this stark beep comes from, you know... One of the one of the one of the missiles, and then this toaster is going to be Tony Stark's um, armor, um, Iron Iron Man's armor, and I was just like, "Cool, man! I'm, this is so exciting!" And then seeing that come out, and then everybody losing their minds over that is just—it's kind of like he's a, he's a little sorcerer himself, I think. Like, <laughs> He absolutely well, is, yeah. So before I let you go, I just want to kind of take one element of the show and kind of maybe pick it apart a little bit. The plot of the show involves Vision becoming kind of two characters at the same time. I'm trying not to give it away for anyone who hasn't quite seen it. But Vision ends up at one point talking to himself, which uh, I learned is spectral vision, not white vision, apparently. You're not supposed to say white vision. I'd never... Uh, anyway, uh, so spectral vision. I didn't know, I didn't know that either for what it is. Yeah, like. who knows? It's comic book nerds. I saw it on YouTube. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so they're talking to each other, and now the spectral vision has an effect on his voice. Uh, how does that effect come about, and how much is it baked in might not be the right phrase, but how much is decided before it gets to the mix stage and how much of it evolves on the mix stage? Maybe if we can talk our way through that. So the way that happened, that happened, I mean, we had that scene from that episode very early on and I'm going to call him White Vision because that's what we call him. (laughs) White Vision was existed in the Ultron movie. And so there was a treatment put on the Ultron movie. So I asked Laura Hirschberg, who was the mixer on the Ultron movie, what she did, because that was all done in the mix. So she sent me a bunch of plugins, and I took those plugins. I took Paul Bettany's voice, and I did like four different versions using varieties of those plugins. And then I said, Steve, what do you think of these? He says, oh, those are really good, but I, I got this, this special mushroom sauce we're going to put on. So we, we did a version of, of his favorite with the mushroom sauce. And then we sent all, I think, five of those to the picture editor and the director. And Matt came back. He said, I really like version three with, with the mushroom sauce. So he is version three with, or whatever it is, with, with the mushroom yeah. sauce. And that, that kind of, it's, I think, I don't think we baked it in. I think it may have stayed live. No, we, we did bake it in. I'd set up a bunch of aux tracks and I'd set up a little bussing thing so that when we got these, like if they changed the line or something, I could just drag it down to a track, re-record it back into the channel, and then I'd have it baked in. And then there were a couple of times, I think in the latter, the last two episodes, where there were a, a line that was like softer and so the effect didn't come through as much and so we had to kind of play with that. But Danielle had the um, plugins in the session so she could adjust them as needed. So they were kind of baked in, kind of not. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny with stuff like that. I feel like, you know, you, you want to make a decision and stick with it and move on and <laughs> and <laughs> use your time for something else. Um, but yeah, we did we did carry the elements live and there was some um, kind of back and forth um, as to what the processing would sound like because it is, you know, what they did was, was super cool and everybody loved it and it was, you know, it was there and it was crunchy and, and kind of diabolical, but it wasn't. You know, it was still it was still vision. You know, it wasn't totally different. All about uh, the mushroom sauce. All about the mushroom sauce. But you know, you end up you you get so used to it, you you kind of lose the processing. You forget that it's on there, and so then there's conversations of like, well, we we need more. We need we need more. We need more. You know, and we need to kind of play with the wet dry a little bit. And like Kim was saying, you know, Paul Bettany's voice is so low to begin with, especially when you do kind of that crunchy distortion on, on the low end. It's it's a little bit harder to hear. So we kind of played around with you know 
pumping up the higher distortion a little bit to make it a little bit crispier, but um, ultimately the decision that Gwen and Steve um, came up with, we, we ran with because that was, it sounds really cool. It's, it's, ter- it's terrifying, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, I guess, a sound that I, well, who knows, but I assume that's going to come back in future movies. He just kind of flies away at the end, so I assume we'll see him again. We, but, we, uh, we, can't, so, we can't tell you. Yeah. <laughs> of course. That's, I'm not asking yeah. you to tell me. I'm just saying you probably took notes on it is all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, as a last question, if maybe each of you could go through and maybe talk about uh, what your favorite kind of sound moment in the series was that you either worked on or blew you away. Uh, Kim, do you want to go first on that one? You know, I did like – I did – Four, I cut four episodes of dialogue, and and then I kind of dabbled in a couple others. The Halloween party was kind of interesting and fun because there was a lot. Of, there was the crowd, so you had to clean all that up. And um, I don't know. I mean, I I, I kind of liked all of it. <laughs> I don't know that I have a favorite. I think that that's such an unfair question for something like this because each episode is so drastically different. You know, that was definitely something I felt on the mix stage of, like, you finally feel like you have mastered 1950s, finally feel like, and, and you're moving on to 60s, and you get and you get the 60s down, and now it's the 80s. And then, but before that, you're in full Marvel base camp military above modern times, basically. You'll have these little rewarding experiences of each episode and then be forced to move on and, and find your next rewarding experience. Um I would say the whole of episode nine. And episode nine, I think, was my favorite to mix. It were, there were just, it was just beautiful moment after beautiful moment of incredible score, amazing sound design. And that was just like, it's a massive episode. You know, you're pro- probably in a dozen different eras and locations, you know, all at once. But that was just the, the writing on that episode, the acting on that episode, you know, obviously the writing and the acting throughout was incredible. But... Episode 9 and 10, I probably watched easily 20 times through, and every single time I was crying at some, at some point. I'm just like, oh, it's so beautiful. Like, <laughs> the music and the, and the dialogue, it's just, it's so great. I love, I love that. I love the moment of her in the um, Hydra cell finding the Infinity Stone. Um, I love the finale um, when um, her and Agatha are fighting in the sky that was so much fun to mix especially because you know at that point we were like probably over close close to 100 days in of just confinement in this room and you had this big kind of like a little like score that's like a little club like a little ravey you know and like you have these big like uh, thunder and lightning moments and these big rune moments and that was like so much fun to mix. I was just on my face, just like, yeah, baby, let's go. <laughs> and Wanda's just kicking ass. Like, that was that was such a good one to mix. And then at the end of that episode, um, when her and Vision wrap up the, the series, again, just, like, heart-wrenching, calling my boyfriend, like, I love you, never leave me. <laughs> <laughs> I should clarify something, too. You mentioned 9 and 10, Danielle. When we were doing this, we originally were, I guess it was going to be 10 10 doesn't exist, Danielle. Oh, right. Yes, yes. But uh, there was never, I don't think broadcast-wise, there was an episode 10, so it would have been 8 and 9. 8 and 9, yes. Just not to confuse any of the listeners out there that are going, what, there's an episode 10? We didn't see it? Oh, my God, yeah. And Gwen, did you want to take a shot at that? I love the evolution of all the episodes and, you know, from the from the just even the music you have Jimi Hendrix in one of them you had like you know this goofy super sappy stuff for you know the full house episode but <laughs> I mean being a bit like Kim a, a dialogue ADR person for the most part you spend 90% of your life trying to make dialogue sound pretty and good and clean and get rid of lip smacks and everything so for me it was really fun to fuck up Vision's voice for the white Vision. It was really fun to do the montages for Monica when she wakes up in the hospital and all that kind of stuff when they're, you know, when people are are unblipping and also when she's going through the hex, I got to kind of do sound designy stuff to the voices. That was really, really fun for me because I don't, 
us Dalek people don't normally get to do that. So I had a very good time with that. And the whole fact that it actually kind of stayed, it's like, oh, look, they used what I did. It was very nice. So like, check that out. I can't. I can't. Oh, it's okay. It's You know, it was hard to leave at the end because you get, you know, you get really close to him. I, I love Vision. I have a gigantic crush on Vision. He's, just, he's fantastic. And Lizzie is as one. She's, you know, she even changed the way she read the uh, previously on WandaVision and the 50, you know, the second episode, she's super perky and, you know, she, and she changed her perform. Kim recorded those. I mean, she changed her performances for that. And so just kind of watching how the characters morph through the whole thing too. I love the scene where um, uh, Monica figures out that the brother is really just <laughs> a deadbeat surfer guy. <laughs> and it's kind of funny. And you know, when she's, yeah. And it's really moving at the end. It's a, uh, you know, when he says goodbye, I mean, it is. It's a little tear jerky moment so when he says, you know, what is grief but love, you know, persevering. It's like, oh, oh, I have to remember that. <laughs> I mean, it's a beautifully written written series, and it all is super tight, and I adore Matt Shackman, and the editors were great. It was, okay, maybe hindsight's golden rosy 2020, and I would say I would do it all again. And it's not, it, it was hard. <laughs> it, it was definitely hard. <laughs> It really helped that we worked with super reasonable people. The people at Marvel, they were they were not jerks, and they knew what we were going through, and they knew that we were all working to get them what they wanted as quickly as we could get it to them at a at a quality level that they expected and that we also expected from ourselves. And the fact that everyone was on that same page. There were definitely the challenges. I mean, you know, VFX came in later than they were supposed to, and poor Steve was sound designing to basically drawings in some cases. It was challenging, but it was really rewarding for sure. It was. I, I will. I think about this quite a lot because, yeah, it was it was definitely the most challenging thing I've I've done to date. But I and I don't really think that, you know, again, you have the challenge of it's the, the pressure of Marvel's first X, Y, Z, you know, you have the pressure of a pandemic. You have a pressure of a brand new format that nobody knows how to mix or or to or to cut or to do anything to because it's brand new and then obviously the pressure of just us wanting caring and wanting to do a really good job it was it was it was super 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 difficult at times and I do not think that it would have gotten to the level that we finally got it to if we didn't have a crew of people who had shared the same mindset of like whatever it takes just whatever it takes plus we had just incredibly talented and insanely experienced people doing this as well, you know, so it, it got crazy and it got gnarly, but nobody seemed to, you know, that was not new for, to anybody. And also everybody knew how to do their jobs incredibly well and just had the mentality of like, just suck it up and do it and get it done and, and have a smile on when you do it, you know? And I think that that is really, really special. And when I think about, when I think about Skywalker, that's what I think about. And when I think about working with Skywalker women in particular, some of the, definitely the hardest working people I've ever seen in my entire life. I wish life. we could bottle the attitude of the crew on this show because it, it really was, it was, it was phenomenal. There was not a single me, 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 there was none of that ever. Not a single person did any of that stuff. I mean, you might do a little bit of a sigh when what you just finished working on changed again, but you, you know, it's a private sigh that no one saw it. And I could not have asked for I do want a bottle. I want. I want Wanda Vision attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Big Wanda attitude. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Another aspect that we didn't really talk about is this is not standard Marvel fare. Like the, the risks were being taken on this show, plot-wise and narrative-wise. It could have fallen flat on its face, and it didn't. And a lot of that, I think, has to do with the soundtrack holding it all together. 
So uh, congratulations on the work that you did and uh, it was a massive success both artistically and commercially and uh, thank you very much for talking to me about it today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having us. This was super fun. Yeah, thank cool. you for, it's nice to remember it. Thank you very much. Film Beggars is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Morrow. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H or leave us a tip. Just go to tonebenderspodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening. If you are interested in more pro audio related content, stay tuned to hear what other members of the Audio Podcast Alliance are releasing. To learn more and find links to other shows similar to Tonebenders, go to audiopodcast.org. Hi all, this is Becky and Susan from the Sound Girls Podcast, where we speak to audio professionals from all walks of life. Join us Tuesdays at 9 a.m. and listen to the amazing array of sound humans talk about how they got into the biz. And a few cool things, like roadie nicknames and fizzy water preferences. You can find the Sound Girls podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, as well as our website, soundgirls.org.